Welcome everyone. Helping Parents Heal is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents. Through support and resources offered, we aspire to help individuals become shining light parents, meaning a shift from a state of emotional heaviness to one of hopefulness and greater peace of mind. HPH goes a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence in a non-dogmatic way. HPH affiliate groups welcome everyone regardless of religious or non-religious background and encourage open dialogue. Attendance at all HPH meetings is voluntary. All the discussions that take place at affiliate led meetings are confidential. We hope that participants will learn from and share with each other. Zoom meetings run by HPH leadership are not confidential. These meetings typically feature guest presenters and are posted on YouTube so that affiliate members worldwide can watch and benefit. Neither type of HPH meeting is designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Helping parents heal, offers a wide variety of speakers, allowing parents to learn about many possible ways to heal. This includes presenters covering progressive topics, such as afterlife evidence and connecting with children who have passed. The views expressed by our guest speakers may or may not reflect the opinions of helping parents heal leaders and members. So we ask that you take from their presentations whatever may benefit you personally. Thank you. That was perfect. And I am really excited to have Teresa here um, from London today. She is a very, very well-known um, author, and she has written some exciting books about dreams, about all different kinds of things about the afterlife. But this book that she just recently uh, wrote is it allows us to be able to work on our own psychic skills and one of the things that she says over and over again is that we all are capable of doing this which is just so exciting to me and um i wanted to first just read a short bio before i uh turn it over to teresa um who is just such a sweetheart, and we're just so excited to have her here. Um, Teresa Chung has been researching and writing about the afterlife, angels, and dreams for the past 25 years. She has a master's degree from King's College, Cambridge University, in theology and in English, and several international best-selling books, including two Sunday Times top 10 bestsellers to her credit. Her dream dictionary A to Z, which is something that I consider one of my Bibles from Harper's Collins, regularly bounces to number one in its Amazon category and is regarded as a classic in its field. And two of her angel titles hit the Sunday Times top 10. Her spiritual books have been translated into over 40 languages, and she has written numerous features for national newspapers and magazines. Her media appearances include an interview with Pierce Morgan on GMTV and guesting on an episode on episode 71 of Russell Brand's Under the Skin podcast and Decoding Dreams live on Coast to Coast AM. And we all know how important that is. Mark Ireland will be on there um, this week, actually. Um, she works closely with scientists studying consciousness and has her own popular spirit podcast, White Shores. It's a beautiful podcast. Her website is www.teresachung.com. And she has a busy author page on Facebook, as well as an author page on Instagram and Twitter. Please go to her website, again, www.teresachung.com. I will be copying it and pasting it in the chat box. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming the beautiful Teresa Chung. Welcome, Teresa. Wow, thank you, Elizabeth. My birthday twin, well, almost, because we're nearly born the same day, aren't we? I love that synchronicity. And as you were talking, um, the synchronicities just came in because on Monday, 
uh, Mark Island's publicist um, got um, got in touch with me last Monday to interview Mark Island. So I'm talking to him on Monday for my podcast. Wonderful. And I, you know, and I have been, you know, preparing for it and thinking, my goodness, helping parents heal. Because I, I was just drawn to him because his what of what his book's about. Because he's looking at mediumship and so anything like that, they know that my podcast is the place to go. And I just, how lovely! I'm speaking to him. Well, Monday. I just to tell you very quickly that Mark Ireland's son, uh, Brandon, passed on a mountain, and the first book that he wrote, which was Soul Shift: Finding Where the Dead Go was something that was brought to me by the first medium that ever came to my house um, because he had signed it for her. And um, he is definitely, um, I, I, I think I can say with certainty that I only know of three children who have passed on a mountain uh, in Helping Parents Heal. So it was, it was definitely meant to be that uh, we met. And I'm excited that you'll be meeting Mark, that's wonderful. Yeah, well, but of all the timings, you know, that it, it happened when I organized, you know, because we organized this a while back, didn't we? And it's just Monday and the same time, five o'clock. Um, and, and I sincere apologies, everyone. I couldn't do the later time. It's just it's getting the quiet. <laughs> and as you see, I'm turning my camera off and thinking, oh, my goodness, the door's open, whatever, because I haven't got my backdrop here. So apologies for that. And thank you so much for the earlier time, because I know that it's out of your usual um, rotor. So thank you from my heart. Um, I, I would really like to be able to hold up your book empower your inner psychic i um i know that you have a copy i have um as i say here in the states they only sell it as a kindle book but um it's beautiful i have that um beautiful cover on uh the event co uh, cover as well but i had so much fun reading it because of course um i think that we all think that we have some abilities and that we are all psychic in a certain way. You obviously start out um, by giving an introduction that is just so interesting, um, that goes back quite a ways, actually to the first moon landing. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Of course, of course. I mean, I wrote Empower Your Inner Psychic because it's kind of, um, a culmination of my decades of research in this area. As you know, Elizabeth, I have been writing for nearly three decades, um, but in the early part of my career, it was a collection of true life stories because um, I, I regard those as data. And I was very blessed because I, I literally was having two books a year coming out with mainstream publishers like Random House, Simon and Schuster. But they were doing no promotion for the books at all because they were kind of embarrassed of it. They didn't quite know where to place it and it was a constant surprise that the book kept popping up in the Sunday Times top 10 of course it is people want to know that heaven is real that there is an afterlife and that was the message because these were stories people were sending to me saying I had an afterlife dream I sensed the presence of a departed loved one and I was collecting these all together and giving my own sort of academic analysis of it as well, plus my own experience. Um, and I was doing that for years. I did it for 15 years. And, and you know, it's not, I feel it very much was um, heaven sent what I was doing, because it's not easy to get a book published at any time, specifically about that kind of topic. And this is the UK, very skeptical. I do think that the reason I got them published was again, I never quite understood why I was, because um, I was born in a family of psychics and spiritualists, but I, and I was home educated, but I ended up at King's College Cambridge, where I read religion and theology, studied dreams in particular. Um, when I was at Cambridge, I found that study of the afterlife and dreams was deemed at that time, this was 30 years ago, unscientific. So I soon learned that I couldn't do that there. So as soon as I left, I was able to like, write about it and but because I had the academic credentials the door opened with the publishing community to allow me in it was like and I was very much trying to be very careful in how I presented it because I'm aware that you you know when you're dealing with this subject matter with a mainstream publisher they want the other side so I tried to be very balanced so I did this for years and years and years but then what happened is we entered the lockdowns and COVID of course 
And suddenly there was an openness to um, the possibility of an afterlife as never before. Of course there was, because it was a time of great grief and loss and people were on their own often if they were in furlough um, because they couldn't get to work and they were you know, isolated from their community. And there suddenly became an openness to this that had, it was shocking to me because of all these years I'd had to do it under the radar, promoting this message. There is an afterlife, I feel it, I know it, and so do other people. Um, but there was an openness and I found myself being invited on all these amazing programs to promote this message. And now I can honestly say that we can really talk about these topics in a way that we couldn't. Well, I certainly couldn't. Um, outside the, I mean, as I know you have a community of helping parents here is amazing of people who are very in tune with this message. But the books I write are firmly geared towards the mainstream where people have a lot of opinions <laughs> let me put it that way but there was an openness of it that I'd never noticed before so what my publisher wanted me to do was to write a book which would draw on the scientific research out there right now because they know I collaborate regularly with scientists and neuroscientists I've co-authored a book with Dr Julian Mossbridge Dean Raid in the lights of that they knew that so they wanted me to write a book that would take everything up to date and have a very bold statement about the possibility of an afterlife. And, you know, and they let me do it finally. So I bided my time. So Empower Your Inner Psychic, I'm so proud of it because it is where I can really sort of come out as it were with this research and present it um, in a way that I was not able to before. Um, I had to have the decades before that because I came very much from a belief, I believe, and so do lots of other people, but I wasn't able to go to the nitty gritty, the science, um, where the science is right now. And also to back it up with expert interviews because every person who's been on my podcast up until uh, mid 2022, when I finished the book is a footnote. Whenever I make a point about reincarnation, about angel babies, about afterlife, about near-death experiences, I will have a footnote, including yours, <laughs> Elizabeth, you're in the book and you're mentioned in the back. Um, so the people can, when I make a point and, you know, they want to know more, they can go and listen to an episode where I talk to Eben Alexander, for example, the likes of Raymond Moody, all these, all these icons in the field that you all know so well. And I was able to do it. And, and when the book came out last February, I couldn't believe it. It went to number 15 here of all books on Amazon here in the, in the UK. And I just felt like this is, this is bliss that people were so open to it. And I was invited onto BBC, BBC Sounds to talk to a lead presenter there, Nikki Campbell, who gave me an entire episode to talk about dreams and the possibility of an afterlife. And for the first time, I wasn't invited on as I had been maybe in the past when I did media with, media, with these presenters kind of being a bit patronizing or down talking. And I feel that to be at this state now in 2023 is is a dream come true and what dreams may come in the future now with this openness and helping parents heal that I constantly champion has played a huge part in that. You are very, very influential. The work you all do and the shining light parents. I mean, the episode that I recorded with you about your book, your book, so popular, thousands of downloads. And it was like people had never heard this message before. And it's, it's for us because we've done it forever. It's like, well, of course, of course, consciousness goes on. Of course, there is a possibility of life after death that's very, very real. Of course, there's science that's proving it. Of course, we're all psychic. It was like people were hearing it for the first time. Absolute joy to be alive, really, um, and to feel connected to all the people I've loved and lost in my life as well. It was almost like they were saying, yes, come on <laughs> with this message. <laughs> And that's why I love what you do, Elizabeth, and everyone at Helping Have Parents Heal. And I say that whenever I interview you, it's the joy. Well, I just want to say that I love this book so much because you are addressing skeptics. You are talking yeah. to people who are not necessarily, maybe they're on the fence, but are not necessarily there yet. And so you are constantly telling people that it's good to believe, but it's much more important to question. And I think that that is the foundation of helping parents heal too. Um, 
we don't expect anyone to believe the way that we do. But I think that it really is important for us to be trying to find answers to where about where our loved ones in spirit are, what they're doing. And, um, and if we do believe that there is an afterlife, and for, for me, obviously, it's a done deal, but it's something that I don't think that um, uh, I think that now in our society, as you say, it's becoming so much more of uh, the norm than just um, the the outlayers who are the people who are writing books that are not necessarily as read. But this book, again, is so incredible because, again, it starts with the moon landing. And I just yeah, sorry, I didn't mention. I, I know, you got, but then it also goes through these seven different, very clearly defined. Um, steps to be able to develop your inner psychic and with with activities that you need to do at the end of the of the lessons, yes. which is also wonderful, and then a beautiful conclusion. But um, maybe you can talk just a little bit about um, the way that the book is put together. And as, as I say, I, I just thought that that whole start was so beautiful because that was back in the 60s. Um, Absolutely. Happened. I mean, I started with that because I just find it such a compelling story. And I know you've in interviewed a lot of uh, Institute of Noetic Scientists or, uh, with at Parents Heal. But the message is that, you know, Edgar Mitchu, who founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where they research afterlife and consciousness and take it seriously, he had this transcendent experience when he was coming back from his last moon shot really he was coming back to earth and he had a kind of an out of body experience and when he came back to earth and hung up his moon boots he actually found that transcendent experience more fascinating than being in space and the message is there clear is that we search outside ourselves for this meaning you know hum humanity goes to outer space but the real adventure, the real ride and joy and thrill of our life is the inner space. And Edgar Mitchell, you know, he devoted the rest of his life to investigating the inner space with it, the same scientific rigor that he investigated outer space. And he's saying, he said he was, he's on record as saying it was far more thrilling doing that. And if only people could understand that message right from the start, I'd be happy if they didn't really read the rest of the book, although I'd love them to read the rest of the book. But it's such a powerful message that everything you need to know for your healing and to find meaning is within you already. We come with this inbuilt inner psychic. It's such a beautiful gift. The problem is that a lot of people like me when I was growing up, because I grew up in a family of mediums, psychics and spiritualists, I didn't think I had a gift because I couldn't see angels with my physical eyes. I didn't think I, I was I was precognitive. I, I really thought that the vivid dreams I had and intuitive hunches were not worth paying attention to because I grew up with people who would go into trances and, and channel and all that. And I didn't seem to have that ability. But my ability lay in academica and researching it, because I think one of the reasons I probably was offered a place at Cambridge was my passion shone through. I wanted to understand my own family, really, really to understand. And was this real? You know, so so, you know, these these most people think that if they don't have a blinding vision or a road to Damascus moment, that they're not psychic, they're not a medium, they're not, not spiritual, etc. And that is so not true. We all have it. What we lack is belief in it. And I have come to the firm conclusion, having poured through all the research, read it all, that being psychic is very little, very not that much different from self-belief. The two are the same, self-confidence, loving yourself from the inside out. When you do that, it somehow awakens your psychic powers as well. You make better decisions. You sense that there's something more. So for most people, it's actually that journey to self-belief and self-love, which is the journey of all our lives. And a lot of us struggle with it because we've had traumas in the past. Maybe our parents and carers weren't there for us. So we have this diminished sense of self. And what happens then is we look outside ourselves for that validation, be it from career, from relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But as everyone knows, when you have a bereavement, when you lose a loved one, you realize how flawed 
that template for life is because the reason of your life, if, it, if it's a relationship, a loved one, being a, a child or, or a partner or a parent, someone who's given your life great meaning has gone from this external plane, the physical. And all you're left then is the memories, the feelings and the emotions. And it's then usually that you have this powerful psychic and spiritual awakening because you realize that those memories are alive they're still with you. The emotions, the feelings, and the presence of your departed loved one has not gone anywhere. They are a heartbeat away. And it's only a bereavement often that awakens that. But you don't necessarily have to go to, through a bereavement. I'm saying in this book, especially for the young readers, you don't have to go through a bereavement to get to that point of knowing that your inner psychic is alive within you. Again, another problem with people is that we're all on a sensitivity spectrum. Some of us very high, you know, these are the mediums, the professional mediums and psychics. They are very high on the spectrum. Other people, myself included, are probably somewhere in the middle, vivid dreams, hunches. And then you get people who are very rational and logical, data-driven, who say they are not psychic. They don't believe in an afterlife. But when those people at the bottom of the scale are put on a simple course of meditation for three weeks, what happens is that it activates the part of their brain that is intuitive, creative, and psychic. And what happens to them is really fascinating because when they then start having dreams and hunches, they are so much clearer than people at the top of the spectrum. And I'll tell you why. People at the top of the spectrum who are very psychic, their issue is that constantly information's coming through that's psychic from the other side, from the afterlife. And it's very hard for them to distinguish, well, is this really from the other side or is it negativity or wishful thinking? However, people down the bottom of the scale, when they are awakened psychically, they use their logic and their reason to actually know when something's the real deal. So what I'm saying is wherever you are on the psychic spectrum, right down the bottom or right at the top or in the middle, you can awaken your inner psychic. You just need to approach it in a different way. People who are highly sensitive need to learn boundaries and distinguishing when it is their inner psychic in the afterlife speaking to them and when it is wishful thinking or negativity. People right down the bottom, they need to awaken it in the first place. And the simple key, which is often the key to everything, is course of meditation. You can just get people on a who say they aren't psychic on a simple course of meditation, they will be by the end. And if they won't do meditation, the next best thing is dream work. Tuning into their dreams and starting to see that there is a deep within them. The deepest part of themselves is talking to them every night. So what I'm saying is that wherever you are, you can activate it, this, this inner psychic, this inner therapist, this inner medium. It's within us all. You just need a slightly different approach. That, and that's really what the book is about and saying, go on, prove to yourself. And by the end, let me know. And it's wonderful that people by the end of the three or four weeks, they are starting to have vivid, highly creative problem solving dreams. They are starting to sense the afterlife in a way that they never did before. It's, it, it's absolute bliss. And what I've done in the book as well is all the exercises and all the research, it is all research-based. But there's, I can say, well, this works because, but the first thing we've got to work on is belief. If you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe you're psychic, it won't happen for you. It so just won't happen. That is psych yourself out. So that's the first lesson. And I absolutely love that. And so you bring in all of these incredible researchers and professors who have been studying this for years. One of them is actually someone who's presented to Helping Parents Heal over and over, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who's in Tucson at the University of Arizona, and he has presented at our two conferences as well. And I, I think that um, one of the other things about your book that I just adored is that you talk about the fact that we have to love ourselves, um, mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. have to forgive ourselves, we have to be able to allow ourselves to um, know that we are exactly the right person 
at the right time. And um, there, well, so you start out obviously bringing in all of these specialists to tell about um, the research that's been done in quantum physics and all of these other, that everything is energy, that we're all um, energetic beings and we're all vibrating at different um, different uh, rhythms, but that we are all basically um, the same thing, obviously. We are all the same thing. And what it all comes down to, in my eyes, is that the only important thing in this world is actually love. That's that's all. Yeah, and it begins with love for the self. And that is the hardest love of all. Most of us, especially people who are very compassionate and have always put other people ahead of themselves, and that's beautiful. But unless it comes from a solid foundation, it is kind of like a recipe for unhappiness. Because um, a lot of us think it's, oh, it's selfish, selfish to focus on me. It's selfish to look at my dream work or, or, or to, to meditate or whatever, because I should be rushing around helping other people. Yes, it's a wonderful urge and impulse. But what I'm saying is, hey, slow down, because actually loving yourself is a great gift you can give to the world because when you love yourself not in a narcissistic way i mean i talk about narcissism in the book as well work with a lot of leading narcissist specialists as well talk to them it's not that kind of love it is loving the gift of your life and the opportunity to experience this material world in all its many facets right it's loving that getting to that and that is the hardest thing until you can do that, it's going to be very, very hard for you to awaken psychically or even sometimes to have an afterlife encounter. Because we do live in a, in a, a world of energy and like energy seeks like energy. And the other side is love. It is just, that's the fuel. That's, the, that's everything there, that's the source. And unfortunately, if someone is hating and hating on themselves, the afterlife may want to break through, but they can't because there's not that magnetic attraction. It's not because they don't love you or they don't want to. They really want to. And what they want is for you to fall in love, heart, mind, body and soul with yourself first. Because as soon as you do that, the rest is, I'm not going to say easy. It just happens. Get to that self-belief, right? Get to that. A lot of people try to be psychic without working on the self-love, it won't work. It just won't work. Your messages will be, will be scattered and random and they won't be fulfilling for you or the person you're trying to help. You have to get that solid foundation first. You have to psych yourself out and try to understand why it is that you don't believe in yourself and you don't love yourself. And that requires a lot of in-depth work but it is worth it because when you do that you raise the vibration not only your own vibration but you contribute to raising the vibration collectively i think every time someone really genuinely understands themselves better and falls in love with themselves it makes the world a better place and it opens up the world more psychically and it brings heaven closer to earth it truly is a gift you give others as well as yourself when you do that, if you can try and think of it that way, <laughs> because research shows that um, psychic ability is limited most of all by low self-esteem. That's where the research is going now. And, and there's sort of the data, the conclusions are, look, hey, if this person is coming from low self-esteem, it's not that's why the results are not coming in. It's the psychics that have this calm, inner calm and peace. And inner calm and peace is achieved through self-care and self-love. And also knowing that we're here on this earth for a reason, to learn lessons. So keep your feet on the ground, right? We do live in this material world. So practice self-care for your body, you know, like the yoga you do, this with all this. But also it's balancing that with the intuitive and creative. If you haven't got that balance, that's when you don't feel inner peace. If, if it swings one way when it's all the material and there's no inner world, that leads to unhappiness. However, it can swing the other way. And you may see that in our community. Sometimes people go too far the other way 
that it's almost like they kind of disconnect from the material world we live in because they're head in the clouds, if you like, what I mean, that awful term, woo-woo. That's just as bad. That can lead that can lead terrible life choices. You need to find that balance as long as you're in this body between the body and the soul. Um, and again, that's what the book draws on research with that. How do you find this inner balance? And you know what research is showing? One of the simplest ways to do that is to listen to music you love. Music, time and time again, has been shown to bring in a piece. And I'll tell you why your logical, rational, material mind is trying to make sense of the notes. It's working. It's doing what it does best. You know, the material, logical part of you has a, has a function, which is to help you sense patterns and to, to have order and to have a plan. So that part of you is working as you listen to music. But the leaving the other part of you free to dream. So what happens when you listen to music you love? It really is a, 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 almost like a prayer. Both parts of you, the intuitive and the logical, are doing what they do best without disagreeing. They're walking sort of side by side. They, they may, may disagree violently with each other, most of the time, but in when you listen to music you love or you meditate or walk in nature or spend time in your pet, these two parts of yourself <laughs> are agreeing to differ, but in harmony, right? Understand that. And it's a really solid foundation for doing your psychic work and for connecting to your inner psychic and the other side. There's power in music. There really is. And if you've ever watched Stranger Things, I'm sure you, <laughs> you know, the lead, one of the lead characters, wasn't it, was rescued by a song because she was so on the dark side and so lost herself. And the only, they tried everything, the other characters, to pull her out of this darkness. And it was the power of music. Um, another thing that has great power is art and creativity. I recently had the honor actually of interviewing the, I don't know if you've interviewed them, uh, Elizabeth, the producer of that blissful film, What Dreams May Come, uh, starring Robin Williams. I'm sure you all know it. Yes. Have, you, have you seen it? Yeah. Yes, yes it's beautiful. And how, how he is able to connect through his departed life, through her painting, because that's how they meet. Because when, and he, he actually, in the interview, he explains, I'm, I'm very happy to connect him with you if you want to, how it took 20 years to make that film, to get, you know, Steven Spielberg was on, you know, and it was actually Robin Williams that um, was made all the difference because they needed a big star to do this film about the afterlife. And he tells this lovely story about how um, the script was sent to Robin Williams and they were waiting with bated breath nervous and then the phone rang and Robin Williams said I don't only want to play the main part I want to play all the parts <laughs> and it was just so so um so him um and he there was only one person who could play that role uh, I think it was absolutely beautiful film and when people ask me what's heaven like and I say go watch when what dreams may come and how they created heaven because they say everyone's heaven is is personal they when the character of Robin Williams goes to heaven, he goes in a painting because that's how, where her, his wife, his wife was grief stricken by the loss of her children and she poured her feelings into her art. And that's how they connect through art and creativity. It's not, sorry, I've gone on a tangent. It's just, I'm just, because I recently interviewed him and it really lingered with me because I mentioned that film so many times and it makes me cry and smile every time I watch it and to, you know, the law of attraction at work. I could not believe it was through your lovely friend, Sandra uh -huh. Champlain. I, yeah, she can. And I, I, I could not believe that I was speaking to the person who made it possible, who brought that gift to the world, because so many people have found great healing through it. And it's actually fascinating now because his, he is, his wife has passed and he's having an afterlife communication with her. So he feels that what dreams may come kind of foreshadowed his entire life and he, he's actually written a book about it called what dreams have come which is his wife passes and then he goes on a journey of connecting to her and this powerful realization at the end his whole life was about this 
he had to do what dreams may come to get to the point when he was able to write a book. He wrote it with Neil Donald Walsh's support called What Dreams Have Come. Do check it out. It's a beautiful book. Um, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I should be talking about my own book, but it's such a powerful oh, book. I, it's, it's, um, <laughs> but I, I would love to talk a little bit more about meditation and manifestation. Yes. Also, maybe if you could just tell about the Claire's because you talk about the Claire's in there and I know that some people on here know all about the Claire's, some people don't know as much, but I think that the most important thing for people to understand is that some people are very, very strong in one Claire, some are very strong in others. It doesn't mean that you're not a psychic if you're not uh, strong in all of them, but maybe you can just go through the list and let people know a little bit more about them. Well, yes, of course, you, if you're a very visual person, you know, you like going to see sunsets, you love art, then of course, that's pos potentially how you're going to experience the afterlife is through visual, is through signs and synchronicities in waking life, um, but also through your dreams, through vivid, vivid dream recall. But say you're someone who has a condition called aphantasia. I've struggled with that in my life where you Maybe you've been to meditation classes and they say, visualize a lake and you're walking along the side it and I see nothing. That is far more common than you realize. There's some people who struggle to form mental images. So then you shouldn't be doing a course in visualization because it ain't gonna happen. It won't work for you. Stop trying to, to, to be something you're not. You need to look at the other Claire's then, Claire audience, you know, Claire, Claire sentience, the sense of touch, and to find out what Claire speaks to you and then focus in on that one, right? Stop trying to do, because everybody says visualization, visualization, we hear it so much especially with this manifestation trend. But there are many people in the world who struggle to do that. But it doesn't matter because you can do it in other ways. And I go through all the other ways you can do it. And if all else fails and you find it very hard to identify which Claire you are, please don't feel that this is you're disappointing yourself. You're not, you always have your dreams. Dreams, <laughs> whether, you know, everyone can see things in their dreams, even blind people. Work on your dreams. They, for me, are the door. I'm biased because I've, I've written so many dream books, but I've found they are the most accessible way to connect to your inner psychic. Write down your dreams every single morning, even the dark and difficult ones or the mundane and nonsense and bizarre. Write them down spend time decoding them. And then the third step, which a lot of people uh, neglect, is to go back several weeks in your dream journal and see how your dreams have kind of foreshadowed your future. And you will see that there are precognitive elements in almost all our dreams, but most people don't pick up on that, get the data. And having worked with scientists, I'm very keen on, on data you know, and but you need to collect your personal data, be like a citizen scientist and collect it. And your dream journal is the tool. Please keep it. Now, if your handwriting's terrible like mine and it's difficult for you to write, use a voice recorder. But please go back in time and listen to your previous dreams. They will have offered you stunning insight in a symbolic way often. And when you get that, you get what I call the goosebump moment in the book. When you think, oh my goodness, I dreamt of this person out of the blue, and then a week later they got in touch. How did that happen? I wasn't expecting them to get in touch. Oh my goodness, I dreamt of this situation or this mindset or this emotion, and it's currently playing out. When you are able to do, do that and to see how your dreaming mind is starting to foreshadow your future in many ways. It's a PowerPoint. It's you saying, really doesn't matter what Claire I am. I'm psychic. My dreams are pointing that way, right? Because <laughs> I'm trying to show people they've got it. They've got it within them. We all have. Sorry, that's a very long way of answering it. <laughs> 
Beautiful. And, and I just want to say that that lesson is um, entitled What Dreams May Come, which is just beautiful. Did you did you title yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that I was going to speak. This oh. was like, I wrote this book last year. No, but I always and actually in many of my afterlife books, you know, I've written I'm a I'm a serial afterlife writer. There's often a section, well, what's heaven like? And I've often in different ways said, well, if you want to know, I, I think it's something that comes very close from my conversations with mediums and people who connect to the other side or near-death experiences is that sublime movie what dreams may come i i, I mention it many times go and watch that um because that's kind of gives you an indication of what it might well be like based on reports from medium near-death experiences so yeah <laughs> it was wonderful so wonderful you were able to interview him and I'm excited to hear more. Actually, I want to I want to watch that interview and maybe make it available for all of our um, parents as well. Um, but then you go through so many other uh, in-depth ways of learning how to utilize the abilities that we're all born with, obviously. Um, it, it's interesting because Towards the end of the book, you talk about becoming your own oracle, which which means that you're using other skills such as astrology and different yes. things to be able to uh, manifest your to know better what you are as a person um, or as a soul. And then the last lesson, which is the seventh one, is um, is telling you to uh, show your own psychic abilities, become your own psychic. And so I, I was really fascinated by this because I spend so much time speaking with people, learning how to connect with our kids in spirit and um, talking about the best ways to, um, to have a dream visit um, when we go to sleep remembering to write those dream down dreams down obviously i meditate all the time but i think that this really gives a very good step-by-step -step, um way to be able to move through this and end up with um first of all being a happier person i think it's so important and i think that when you were talking about narcissism earlier I think that self-love is probably the thing that will keep someone from becoming a narcissist more than anything. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the opposite. And it will attract like-minded souls who are also um, people who are the opposite of narcissists. And I've seen an interview that you've done actually about having had issues with that yes. earlier in life. And yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I found because my self belief wasn't there. I mean, I had all the curiosity and passion for writing about this, but I didn't really have self belief. I always always felt I was less than or not enough because I wasn't a medium or a psychic. I couldn't see dead people, you know, to quote Sixth Sense. I, I, you know, and and so I felt that I was less than because of that. I was writing about an area when I wasn't a professional psychic, you know, like many people claim to be. And when you approach your work and your life in that way, what happens is you become a target for people who move in, sense that insecurity, and really can, can give you a very tough time, take advantage. And that did happen to me about 10 years ago. I had a terrible experience with people I trusted with my heart completely, who did not have my best interests at heart and 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 really were very unethical. And I had it was a real moment of looking at myself. Why had, had I not seen the red flags? Why had I, you know, because I was kind, because I, you know, I I was brought up in a very sort of um Christian way. I wanted to actually work in the church. And it was always about seeing the best in others regardless forgiveness, always putting yourself second, which is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful way to live. But the problem is if you go straight into that without a solid foundation of self-love and self-care, you become a target 
for people who will take advantage of you emotionally, financially, and in all sorts of ways. Because you always want to, you think you loving them or giving to them, of course they're going to respond. And it was a horrible realization to, that, that people do not treat you the way you treat them. People treat you the way they are from the inside. And they also treat you how you are. So if you come from a place of low self-esteem, there may be some very kind people who would be conscious of that, but sadly we live in a world where there are people who would take advantage of that. And that was harsh for me because I was always conditioned to think everybody's good deep, deep down. Even people who are, there's always something very good in them. And I still like to think of that, but I have completely grown up in a way, it was very childlike, very, very childlike. And it was awful to learn that actually it was because I was attracting that. Because if I had boundaries in place, if I had enough self-love, the first or second time these people say, didn't follow through, their words didn't match their actions or their actions didn't match their words, which happened time and time again, I wouldn't have given them benefit of the doubt. I would have said, look, wish you well, but this isn't working. Instead, in the past, what I did is I went into overdrive, trying to prove, trying to do more and more and more to get them to. So anyway, yes, that was a big moment for me. And when I started to realize that it does all start from the inside out, and even it starts from the inside out, if you believe you are spiritual and if you are working in this area. Um, I also began to look very challenged, very you know, deeply into professional psychics and mediums and what was going on there. And, and, and some of them have a cult like following, which I, you know, talk about in the book. And I got a lot of media here when I was talking about it. In fact, if you've watched on Netflix, how to become a cult leader, I don't know if you've watched that several of the people in there, the followers who were completely exploited by their guru appear on my White Shores podcast as well. I talk to them and how they entered into this spiritual community filled with trust and love, only to find out years later that their leader was either sexually exploiting them, abusing them or whatever. It's, it's terrible in this community how that can happen, but it won't happen if you start with self-love so that when anything difficult or boundaries are crossed, you will know. So that became my, my, my passion to, to share this message in the spiritual community. You don't need to necessarily follow a psychic or a medium to connect with the other side, to become psychic. It's all within you. What you lack is belief. Now the best, there are some beautiful mediums and psychics out there and you have them on Helping Parents Heal. I love them. Many of them I've spoken to myself, but what they are, the reason that, that they are the real deal is because their mission is to empower people to believe in a way to make their role redundant. And that's the mark of a great teacher, a great healer, is to make their role redundant in the end. And also to, to build a loving community like you are doing here of people who are equal, who are all equal, who are all equal to learn and to support each other. It's so funny it, that you say that. Yeah. I, I do agree. We do have some incredible mediums and it is something that we have to be very careful about and they're all vetted. But I, at the beginning of um, help, Helping Parents Heal, I used to tell everyone that the day that we've done everything that we need to is the day that no one shows up for a meeting, which I truly believe. I mean, it's the same way as the mediums are wanting to be able to teach um, the people who are coming to them for readings how to do it themselves because it's so yes. important for all of us to be able to do this ourselves. For Helping Parents Heal, unfortunately, that's never gonna happen because we always have more children who pass. But, um, and the really nice thing about our group is that a lot of the people who have been here longer really wanna stay and help out the other newer parents who are coming on board and siblings. And, and so I always think that that's such a beautiful thing because being able to help someone else helps us even more and um but it's it is true that um being able to teach um 
people how to do this themselves is the most important tool that we can give anyone because once we are, um, we can speak to our children, we can speak to our loved ones in spirit without having to go through anyone else. And um, that's what I love about your book as well. Thank you so much. I, 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 you know, as I said, there is certainly a role for mediums and psychics because sometimes you just need that, that shift. Where I get concerned is if the person becomes codependent in, in a way and is going for repeat reading after repeat reading. And actually what I found is actually there's a code of ethics. Most mediums actually who are the real deal have a code of ethics and they won't do more than one or two, maximum three readings. There, there should be a code of ethics. So I'm calling people to really have a look at the mediums they go and visit to see, is there a code of ethics? Is this medium empowering me as well? Because when you have a reading, whether, whether proof of survival comes through or not, you've got to leave feeling joyful and empowered and raised up in some way. And sadly, that's not always the case from the people that, you know, because obviously I did a shout out on my social media to get people's experiences of visiting with mediums. And some of that was blissful reading, some of it was not. Um, and, you know, I'm, but the trouble is when someone's very vulnerable and, and really longing for this, this, this proof of survival, you know, it, it, it can be potentially dangerous. So I, the book is also a call to, for people to protect themselves when they go to psychics and mediums and to make sure the, the psychic and medium has a code of ethics doesn't have repeat readings and empowers them. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I do mention, you know, I mentioned you in the, um, I'm sure I mentioned you in the resources as well, um, that that's a way to find out what is an ethical medium and how how they, sh they should work. Um, but again, I would love to have a time when people didn't need to visit mediums and psychics because they just had this knowing. And again, in the book, I have a passionate call for you know, dream work, meditation, psychic abilities, you know, not being frightened of them and having them taught in schools, <laughs> things like that. And people just realizing it's just every day. You know, psychic abilities are not scary. They are not something to be frightened of. It's so, such a shame that in our society, that if you mention that word psychic, people, you know, some certain people will just go, oh, or medium. And that's why I use more mainstream terms like intuition or, you know, science of consciousness. And I, I'm conscious of that in the book because working with HarperCollins, um, my editor was very, very keen for this book to speak to the mainstream. And um, I was very happy for that because how else can you get the message out there? And, and as I said, to be called in by the BBC, BBC their flag, flagship presenter Nikki Campbell and to have an episode he had does a podcast called different okay it's different the podcast people who have a different approach to life but to be called in but you've got to think Elizabeth I've been doing this for nearly 30 years only now you know um but maybe it's all happening for a reason um I mean I was just as passionate in the beginning but the reason it didn't have the, the resonance that I wanted was me not believing in myself and thinking, I'm not psychic, I'm not a medium. Yes, I've dreamt of my departed mother and people I've loved and lost, but is that enough? Is that really an after-life sign? I really was like that. And I now know it is not only enough, it's more than enough. It's all you need. And the more my belief grows, the more I start enjoying my psychic abilities, my dreams, the more wonderful things happen. You know, like you speaking to you today, I feel so blessed, Elizabeth, because I didn't actually know we were going to talk about Empower You in a Psychic. I thought we were going to just talk about after. I didn't really, I know you mentioned it, but I thought, well, like, we're going to talk about afterlife stories yeah. and afterlife dreams. And it was lovely this morning because I, I get messages all the time and someone was saying they had this wonderful dream about their departed 17-year-old um, son who died when he was 17 and how they'd been feeling utterly lost. And in the dream, all it was, it was a real fragment. He was standing at the top of the stairs, waving. 
And she woke up saying, it was like he was there. It was so real and vivid. And this is what you talk about in your book about night visions. And I just know Teresa now, he's not gone. He's in me, he's around me. I can't explain it. And 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 it just came this morning that, and, and, but I get messages like that all the time from people. But it came this morning when I was going to talk to you. I, it's almost like things aligning. And then Mark Island on Monday. It's well, synchronicities happen well, when you believe in them. Um, do you know that his father is Richard Ireland, who was a very famous medium here in the states at the time? He used to do readings for Mae West and all of these people in Hollywood, but he was a billet reader. He used to have a, um, an, uh, something over his eyes and he would pick uh, things out of um, a bowl and he, without being able to actually see what was on it, he would go immediately to the person that it uh, belonged to in the audience. So. Mark has some of these videos on his um, website, but more importantly, Mark is exactly like you. He didn't believe in any of this stuff growing up. His dad was always out of town too. He was traveling, he was highly famous and, and he just kind of poo-pooed all of it. It was difficult um, not having his dad there. And when his son transitioned um, on the McDowell mountain range from an asthma attack, all of a sudden he started being interested in this and actually in his own abilities. And he now does have psychic abilities and um, that existed all along, but he pushed them down. But he comes from the same kind of family that you do. And it's always been very difficult to um, his first book, Soul Shift, Finding Where the Dead Go, which is about his son, Brandon, um, is beautiful, um, but it's definitely very different from most books that were written at the time. That was in 2008, I believe, that he wrote that book. And so I'm excited that the two of you will be talking yeah. in, in common. And this time, this time on Monday. Yeah, we will. I just, I just love it. But of all the timing and also... It's interesting you mentioned forgiveness. I know sometimes it's forgiving ourselves as well as others. You mentioned that earlier, and of course we're in autumn now. And I was walking home today and looking at the trees, which are starting to have that beautiful, rich color. And it's like the wisdom of the world showing us that there's beauty in letting go, because that's what happened when leaves fall, isn't it? There's such a beauty in letting go, in forgiveness, um, in endings with satisfaction in maturity. The beauty and the color of autumn is, is such a beautiful season. But if you think it's actually the season when everything is moving towards transitioning, it's the ending, it's letting go, the leaves fall. You, yeah. for one, you know, they're, they're passing, but they yeah. pass with style and beauty. They show us right at the moment before they fall, how utterly beautiful they are, you know, you know, with all that, sometimes that beauty isn't perfect. There are cracks and flaws in it. But autumn leaves are so, it's such a spiritual experience with autumn leaves. And if you've lost, lost someone, autumn is a month that speaks to you. It just speaks to you on a spiritual level about the beauty in, in, in the miracle of death, really, of, of and the new life it can bring and how utterly beautiful it is. Sorry, I got on a tangent then again, I'm sorry. And I also, sorry, I forgot to say, I've spoken a lot about the producer of What Dreams May Come, and I didn't give his name. It's Stephen Simon. Stephen Simon, I um I would love to connect with him, but I, I also just you. wanted to say that we're- You will love, sorry, you will love talking to him. He is, honestly, he, he the anecdotes, he is also the godson of Frank Sinatra. Oh, wow. and 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 he, he from a Hollywood dynasty, and he's very eager to talk about the afterlife. I think people are nervous to approach him because you know, big Hollywood guy, but he is very very keen to spread this message. He's in his seventies now, that there is life after life, and as I say, his oh, it's become deeply deeply personal now because in I think twenty eighteen he lost his wife. The love of his life 
and he thought that she would not come through. And he speaks very beautifully how she did. Um, I won't say how, but uh, and and how it inspired him. Now he's really becoming, you know, this is his mission. Well, so it, 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 you know. I am excited about speaking with him. And as we're closing here, you always ask people to tell their favorite quote from the Lord of the Rings, which I, you <laughs> actually did in this in this book as well. And I love that whole series. Of, <laughs> as, as, I'm sorry, that's just me being eccentric. I, I do. I've never been able to hear what yours is and you've always asked us what it is. So maybe- it is. It's it's something that I'd like to say about everyone in helping parents heal, especially you, Elizabeth. You are a light when all other lights go out. That's my favorite quote. quote. And I think belief, your belief in, in, you know, there being life after death and experiencing these things is the light when all other lights go out. And that's what we all experience when we do have an afterlife connection. But I, 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 I'm, I care about people who feel they haven't had that connection and really empower your inner psychic is for those people who feel lost, you know, cause it's very difficult. I don't know if you've gone to big conferences and stuff. I certainly have. And I certainly did when I was younger and everybody seemed to be having this connection and I felt that I didn't have it. I'm, I'm really written this book actually for the younger me in a way and, and to show that I do have it. I just need to believe in it. It's a, it's just that simple. Look at all the all of the wonderful things that you've done already, Teresa. Every book that, that you've written, we've ha- we have so many of them here. My daughter is fascinated by dreams. So we have so many of your dream encyclopedias and dream books. And um, I truly appreciate all of that. And let's try to do this again soon. We always ask Are everyone you? still on to just uh, unmute and say thank you and goodbye. People are saying thank you in the chat box as well. And um, so go ahead if you'd like to. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, you, Teresa. Thank you, Teresa. Teresa. It was great. Thank you. So beautiful. beautiful. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. And I'm so glad that you were able to join us. Have a wonderful rest of the evening in the UK. I will. And I'll see you. Lots of love and thank you. And just believe in yourselves, everyone. Because when you believe in self belief, is not no different from being a psychic or a medium. That's where it starts. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. You will. All of us will, especially because of this book. Thank you so much. (laughs) Bye, Teresa. Take care. Bye. Thank you.